Uh, good morning, folks. Instructor Gaynor here. We are rounding out the material in the textbook for fundamentals and ethics. We had recently had a short lecture on chapter 19, which pertains to <clears throat> ethical relativism. We discuss ethical subjectivism, sometimes called individual relativism. Recall what it argues is this, that, that what is ethically right and ethically wrong is basically a matter of the individual's judgment. Now, we all come to, from different places, different sets of experiences. So understandably, we will hold different viewpoints. Now, I think that is just, you know, obviously the case. Now, the question is, if that actually is what defines morality. The author of the text would contend that that is problematic because it, because it forgets, for one, that many people haven't thought much about anything. Many people are just ignorant. For, for lack of a nicer word. Many people are just ignorant. And to say that morality is just a matter of opinion would suggest that whatever is right or wrong is completely dependent upon what you think. Now, and thus, by definition, two people who disagree, well, uh, one thing would be right for one person, another thing would be right for that other person. Now, how does that undermine our conception of what the word right generally means, morally speaking? When we say... Well, the same thing. Yeah. Each individual has a different thing, so that undermines yeah. what the, I guess, the, yeah. the, the common right is or, or whatever. Yeah. I think problem. you're on to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we say that something is right, it is implicit in our saying it, but we just don't mean it in an opinion sense. In other words, we are asserting that something is right in a sort of objective sense. Now, individual relativism or ethical subjectivism denies that there is any kind of objective right. And rightness and wrongness are cliche alerts are in the eye of the beholder. And it has no problem with an individual changing because people's opinions do change with experiences. Now, we couldn't really say that the person made progress in this sense. Why? Because progress seems to suggest some kind of objective standard to measure someone's morality against. And relativism says there is no such standard, unless what? Unless you happen to embrace cultural relativism. Now, the cultural relativist says that rightness and wrongness are determined by what? Yes. Rightness and wrongness are determined by the culture. Now, if you happen to disagree with your culture, you are the person who is wrong, according to cultural relativism. Now, I'll go for some easy examples. There's a famous essay. I use it in my intro courses when talking about this. It is by American uh, <clears throat> anthropologist Ruth Benedict. It's a classic, it's heavily anthologized. What she argues is that what we call morally right and wrong is really just this. When we say right and wrong, all we really mean, if we were to analyze it more deeply, is considered normal within a particular culture. Now here's one of the easy examples that she discusses. In ancient Greeks, the ancient Greek civilization of Socrates and Plato, homosexuality was seen as one of the male pathways to a good, fulfilling life. Now, to be a little more clear about it, 
And she doesn't mention this in the essay, partly because it's just one example and too much context is perhaps unnecessary. To be clearer, for aristocratic males, institutionalized bisexuality probably would have been more appropriate. Because as a male, you would have, as an aristocratic male, you would have been expected to become a householder. AKA, you would get married, you would beget children. In other words, you would have you would have a wife and you would have sexual relations with your wife. But the belief was that the closest of relationships could only be found among equals. They believed that men were inherently superior to women because men were more inherently rational than women were. They believed that male-male sexual activity was one of the pathways to a fulfilling, uh, fulfilling life. Now, of course, if you were looking at this from the perspective of 1950s U.S. of A, you'd go, oh, how could they have supported that view? Well, guess what? Different cultures have different models of what constitutes a good life. That happened to be their way of doing things. It just doesn't happen to be our way of doing things. And their culture arguably did pretty well. Cradle civilization, all that kind of stuff. Now notice, they also had institutionalized slavery and a whole host of other things, as most cultures have. By the way, my saying most cultures have is merely a statement of fact. It's certainly not a statement of approval. Certainly not. So yeah, one of the examples she gives is how the viewpoints about homosexuality differs from culture to culture. The other sort of low-hanging fruit example, and this is one that James Rachels talks about, is the, uh, is <clears throat> the fact that different cultures have different practices for showing respect for the dead. And he harkens back to, a, to an apocryphal story by the Greek historian Herodotus. He tells about how King Darius of Persia called several of his subjects to him. He asked the Greek man, what could I do that would incite you to eat some of the flesh of your dead kinsmen? He was repulsed. When the collation was called before him, he asked him, what could I do for you that would incite you to burn the corpse of your dead kinsmen? The collation was equally repulsed. The punchline is, each man was asked to do what the other guy considered normal and therefore the right way, to show respect for the dead. This shows, this is what the Greek historian Herodotus argues, this shows that wherever you go, culture is king. And by that he means, what people are likely to see as the right way of doing things is a product of acculturation. However, no culture is inherently right or wrong, according to cultural relativism. A, because there is no such thing as inherently right and wrong. And B, because each culture, to an extent, is right for it. Right for it? Well, cultures are things that develop out in a context. They change over time. Certain practices become well-worn habits. And these well-worn habits are sometimes mistaken by some people for being inherently right. No, they're not inherently right. They are just the accepted way of doing things within that culture. Now, many of us are likely to say, well, yeah, this is true. Culture does tend to tell us what is acceptable within that culture. But most of us are not likely to say simply because a culture accepts it, it is therefore right with a capital R. When most of us say right, like I said before, we're kind of implicitly suggesting 
it not just in a relative sense, but in a more objective sense. Cultural relativism, just like uh, uh, ethical subjectivism says, no such thing as inherently right or inherently wrong. Cultural relativism says they are merely products of a particular culture and what it accepts and what it rejects. Now there's, a, and I'm going a little bit beyond the textbook here. There is a reason, institutionally speaking, why most people are malleable to cultural dictates. And this is because not only does the culture have the power to shape the way we're likely to see things, but the culture has the power of enforcement. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here? This is one of the reasons why, even if somebody might have reservations about what is accepted in the culture, they may just decide to cliche, go with the flow. Because the culture has the power to discipline and punish. <clears throat> and discipline and, and punishing might simply mean that person might be an outsider, an outcast, shunned, etc., etc. Now, what happens to abnormals within a culture? Well, Benedict would say they are the ones who are called immoral. But when you say immoral, we really just mean abnormal or different. This is also why within a culture, cultures oftentimes seem to be homogeneous, but cultures can easily hide differences of opinion because people with different opinions are unlikely to do what? To speak up and be the nail that sticks out and gets pounded down. You know, that's part of the power of enforcement. This is why, and I'm, I'm going into depth here, admittedly, more depth than is in the textbook. To go back to Benedict's homosexuality example, homosexuals have always been with us. You're aware of this, right? The only reason why they seem not to be among us is because when you are hated and reviled, you would have to live your lives in the closet or in the shadows. You would have to do this. Now, of course, many of us would say, and I'm tying some, this is review, but I'm tying something together. Some of us would say that we have made some moral progress on this issue. And admittedly, my own politics and ethics are showing here. I would say that we have made some progress. My wife's stepdad would vehemently disagree. What do I mean by I would say we have made progress? Yes, it is less politically correct or politically accepted to be homophobic. In other words, if you are homophobic today in the workplace culture, you probably shouldn't say anything about it if you want to keep your job. I'll give you another one. You know, we don't really tolerate racist language in the corporate sector either. It discriminates, it does amorphous social harm, et cetera, et cetera. I think we have made some progress here. Now, of course, people who would like homosexuality to be continued to be called an abomination would not call it progress. They would say we're going to hell or whatever. You know, pick your expression for it. I would say that a society that is that accepts more diversity a society that is more free and open to differences that really don't amount to hill beans, if you know what I mean. But yeah, I would call it progress. Other people wouldn't. Now, the problem with calling it progress is according to relativism, cultures cannot make progress. Because to say that something makes progress implies that there must be a what? Yeah, some kind of standard that is not what? Yeah. It would suggest that there is some kind of standard that is not relative. 
But subjectivism says no such thing. This is why cultural relativism, all of the author's discussion, is unable to make sense of moral progress. Mr. Dukes. This might be the question. It's hard for me to wrap my head, my, my mind about around what you just said. How is it, how is it different? Because cultural, you say the cultural relativism, you can't, there's no such thing as change. Oh no, I didn't say there's no such thing as change. There's no such thing as progress. progress. Yeah, change certainly takes place, but there is no such thing as progress. And this might be what the sticking point here. Remember, when we say progress, progress means not just change, it means change for the better. The problem is better is an evaluative term. And evaluations, according to relativism, are in the eye of the beholder. Therefore, when we speak of progress, we don't mean progress in an absolute sense or an objective sense. Progress is a matter of opinion. I would say that we made progress and are continuing, hopefully, to make progress. I have some extended family members who would say we have not made progress at all because they still think we should have was it gay conversion camps and things of that nature. You know these things that will put it, uh, turn the gays into straights. You've heard of stuff like this. They think that we should not be accepting these abominations at all. And that we are actually calling, you know, we're ba basically begging for Sodom and Gomorrah here. Incidentally, they're kind of, they're, they're fundamentalists when it comes to this stuff. You know, homosexuality is an abomination in the eyes of God, you know. As a society, by accepting this, we're basically giving God half the peace sign. Yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of their way of interpreting things. They think there's certain things that should not be tolerated at all. Fortunately, they are not the kind of people who also turn to the Bible, for example, to justify racism. You probably know that. Racists in the 19th century used to say, it's a curse on the sons of Ham. And they were darker in skin, in skin than the others, than, uh, than his other sons. You, you've heard this. I mean, these kind of things have been used to justify racism. Isn't that nice? Well, that was a joke, by the way. It's not nice. Yeah, yeah, using religion to try to justify institutional racism and things like that, to justify slavery. Yeah, people used to do it. People still... Some people still do it. Did I answer your question, I hope? I think you did. I, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, and, then, and I'll put this on the board here for anyone who, yeah. Cultural relativism, of course, doesn't deny that cultures change. We certainly have changed over the last 50 years. Change happens, but we have no ground to call it changed for the better. Because change for the better would mean that we have some kind of absolute objective standard to put it up against. And relativism says no such thing. Better and worse are matters of, of opinion. And notice, opinions differ from person to person. There are some people, like I said before, who believe we have not made progress believe we've gotten worse. Others of us think that we are at least partly moving in a better direction. I say partly, largely because for those of you who follow things, uh, Frontline recently did several very troubling programs about the you know, emergence of white nationalism from the shadows. I mean, you just watch Frontline documentaries, it's good journalism, folks. And in a world where there's not much good journalism anymore, I take it where I can get it. So, but yeah, it's a very troubling piece. Now, there are some people who say, yeah, we want to make America. And by the way, this American Nazi actually said making America great again for him means making America white again. Yeah, that's exactly what he said. And he said, when Donald Trump said that, that is what he heard. He says, I'm glad he said he was a nationalist. He's, a, you know, he's, he's our champion. 
Now, whether that's true or not is, uh, uh, I, I guess, is something I can't speak on. But that kind of rhetoric certainly does empower people like that to quote unquote come out of the proverbial shadows, and they have. Oh, and the last thing to review. Remember, according to cultural relativism, an individual can make progress. The individual makes progress when he gets closer to being normalized to his culture's views and values. <clears throat> and sort of the dark side of that was I gave the example that if you took an abolitionist in the 1850s who believed that slavery was an abomination and he wanted to fight against slavery, if you were to take him and convince him that he was wrong to conform with his cultural norms, he would be now making progress because he would be getting closer to his culture. Now, I happen to think it's a little more a, a little more challenging than that. And this is something the author had no time to talk about. Simply because the mainstream of a culture might hold certain things as normal and therefore right, doesn't mean that the culture is in fact homogeneous. Because there's many people within that culture who might disagree with the current cultural trajectory who are trying to, what they would call, change things for the better. The problem is, if everything is relative, you really can't talk about better. You can really just talk about changing things into conformity with what some other people think is better. You can't say actually better, you can say think is better. Was that all right for review, I hope? Good, good. Now, to discuss uh, chapter 20 proper, I already introduced moral nihilism to you. Uh, pronouncing it moral nihilism or nihilism is fine. Both are, are acceptable according to the American Heritage Dictionary. Just lay that out there. Now, <clears throat> I've already said that moral nihilism, Nihil literally means nothing or nothingness. Moral nihilism makes the claim that all of our moral utterances are not really genuine statements. And when I say genuine statements, I mean statements that can be shown to be true or false. And this is because Moral nihilists accept that the world can be discussed and observed empirically. In other words, we can speak in terms of there being verifiable facts about the world. For example, if I say, uh, it is a relative, or it is not raining today, you would say, yeah, it seems to me that is a true statement. Or the sunset, me thinks, is often beautiful. Well, wait, that's different. I did what? I actually made a value claim there. I said the sunset, me thinks, is beautiful. Is beautiful something that can be verified in the same way as I make, might make this statement. One of the colors in this, in this sunset is orange. Now, we have an accepted definition for what the color orange like, looks like. So we could say that that statement is an empirical fact and verifiable as likely true or likely false if the evidence of our senses warrants it. Now, to make the claim that the sunset is beautiful is to make a value statement. Now, you notice that was not a, a moral value claim I made. I made a, an aesthetic value claim. I was talking about, you know, the, the concept of the beautiful. 
Now, value claims, according to moral nihilism, can neither be verified as true or false. And this is because, unlike empirical statements, values are not part of the fabric of reality that can be verified as either true or false. Values are, in fact, human constructs. Now, folks, this kind of an analysis actually comes largely out of the work of a philosopher who we discussed in other contexts this semester. This distinction between factual claims and value claims largely originates out of the work of 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume, who was an advocate of a theory of knowledge called empiricism. If you've taken an intro to philosophy class, you probably encountered some David Hume. We encountered this concept kind of earlier in the course when we discussed that concept called Hume's Orc. That was the idea that we can know value, we cannot know value claims because values are constructs, and therefore value claims are neither true nor false. But we can make empirical statements that can be verified by inspection, and we can determine if they're true and false. Moral claims fall into this category of value judgments. And this is why we cannot have quote unquote moral knowledge, as the author puts it, according to moral nihilism. Because moral claims are value claims, and value claims cannot be they cannot be verified or shown to be false because they are not that kind of statement. Values are not part of the fabric of reality, according to this. And technically, then, all ethics are human constructs, according to this. And if you don't like that word constructs, nihilism says that humans invented morality. And perhaps we needed to invent morality the same way we needed to invent aesthetic judgments. We may have needed to invent morality because we do perhaps need to find ways of regulating ourselves. Why might we need to regulate ourselves? Well, so I individually can find a path to living a better life. Or to put it another way, or I should say in another context, I don't live on a desert island. I live with other people who might be also seeking to eck out what they would call a decent life. Perhaps we needed to invent moral theories so we could at minimum keep us from killing one another, but better yet, perhaps finding a decent set of rules, virtues, or values, depending on your normative theory, so that we could live more cooperatively among one another, hopefully enhancing and enriching, and enriching one another's lives to the extent that we can, rather than making you know, a hell of human existence. So yeah, please don't make the bad straw argument against moral nihilism. Simply because they're saying that moral judgments can be neither ver verified nor falsified, they're not saying it's all bullcrap. Because perhaps, as I just put it, even if morality is not part of the fabric of the cosmos, it doesn't mean that we didn't invent it, and it also didn't mean, doesn't mean that we wouldn't have needed to invent it. Hope that was pretty clear. Now, the author talks about two different strains of nihilist critiques of morality. Now, the first we're going to talk about is error theory, and the second is called expressivism. Error theory largely comes out of the work of Australian philosopher John L. Mackey. You don't have to know that word for the textbook. Now, John L. Mackey, unsurprisingly, walks very much in the 
philosophical footsteps of the likes of David Hume. He is a skeptic, and you shouldn't be surprised about my dropping that term, because we had said that these kind of metaethical critiques are all kind of species of moral skepticism anyway. Now, what, are, what is error theory and what are its claims? It contends that morality is merely a human uh, invention. So in a sense, we call it error theory because the entire project is in fact an error. It is an error to think that we can have moral truths because moral truths are not factual judgments. They are value judgments. Value judgments are things we cannot have truth about. Now, one of the first claims is, and I've already talked about this, there are no moral features of the world according to moral nihilism. Moral features are things that we ascribe to the world. They are not features of the world. The orange color of the sunset is, the fe is a feature of the world. The solidity of a slab of granite is a feature of the world. The, uh, the immorality of abortion is not a feature of the world. That is a value judgment. Two, our sincere moral judgments may try but cannot describe the moral features of things. We can try. But we can't do it because according to this view, there are no such things as moral features of the world. Moral features of the world are human constructs. Three, there is no moral knowledge. Why can't there be according to error theory? Well, because our knowledge claims can only be ascribed to what we would call factual statements. David Hume called them matters of fact. In an earlier chapter, we called those kind of statements empirical statements. In other words, the openness of the door over there can be verified or falsified by inspection. But a value claim, like me, thinks that the color of that door is kind of yucky. That is a value judgment. That statement is neither true nor false. And by the way, even the fact that a buttload of people may find that color to be yucky is no proof. Because that would just mean a lot of people tend to share the same value judgments, perhaps because of cultural conditioning and some such. And that is no empirical proof that something is objectively right, ugly, or whatever. Now, expressivism. Okay, this is the rest of it. Okay. What does the author mean when he contends that expressivists believe that we are not trying to speak the truth through our moral utterances? Now, if anyone cares to speak, that's perfectly fine. I do want to drop at a, some, a little more historical, philosophical terminology here. What the author is referring to as expressivism is very close to what some earlier 20th century philosophers, I guess not earlier, I should say mid-20th century philosophers, known as the logical positivists. You don't have to know that, that school of thought for the test. But they refer to this kind of thinking as emotivism. It was referred to as emotivism. One of the champions of this position was a fellow by the name of A.J. Eyre, an Anglo philosopher. Now, what expressivism claims is this, that our, sincere, our sincerest moral value judgments are not, in fact, expressions of objectively observable moral values that exist in the world. They are really just expressions of they are really just 
expressions of emotional preferences. So to, uh, uh, to put it this way, many people, and this is kind of you know, borrowing from the author's example, many people make the claim that stealing is morally wrong. <laughs> now, what would the emotivist or the expressivist say about this? When you say that stealing is morally wrong, what you are really just doing is asserting your disapproval of it. And your disapproval of it is really just an emotionally charged you know, sort of judgment. And even if it doesn't look emotionally charged, if, you're, if you say something like, I disapprove, even disapprove right there means it's uh, emotive, even using the word disapprove. I disapprove of stealing because it takes away someone's private property that they have a right to. Now you notice I appeal to what there when expressing my disapproval. Yeah, I appeal to the idea of violating rights. Now the expressivist would say, sure, sure, you are appealing to a normative theory there that you claim is something that you are emotionally impartial about. And you, was, and you are sending it because, to it because it's something like the moral law or something. They would say that your preference for the moral law, don't, you know, don't, don't uh, make a mistake and think that, that this is purely objective and purely rational. The fact is you assent to certain things because of your emotional commitments. The, re the real reason why Little Johnny probably disapproves of stealing. Is because his mom and his dad told him that God would send him to hell for breaking the Ten Commandments. So now that's really not all of it. Here's the rest of it. I was told I was given the whole try walking in my shoes argument. In other words, how would you feel if somebody took your candy bar? Oh, so little Johnny says. That's why stealing is wrong, because it would suck if my candy bar were taken. Now you notice right there, that engaged my emotion. It engaged me to think about how it feels. So many people's revulsion to stealing, they think is rational and perfectly objective. When in fact, the way they got there was probably emotional. In other words, we triggered your emotions to try to persuade you <coughs> that stealing is a good thing. I'll go another easy one. And this might sound like our natural law critique before. Many people claim that homosexuality is immoral. And if you ask them why it's immoral, they might say, ew, that's disgusting. Like, well, why is it any more disgusting than any other greasy sexual activity. From a germaphobe's perspective, all of it might be what? Kind of icky and gross and shower time, all that kind of stuff. I hope I didn't yeah. trigger anyone. <laughs> I hope I, I was kind of trying to wake people, you know, wake people up at, you know, was it 9.30 in the morning? But yeah, simple. Now, you'll notice that when the person is making the value judgment that homosexuality is immoral, their basis was really their own emotional disgust with it. Simply because you're disgusted with it doesn't mean it's, it's right or wrong. It merely expresses your emotional revulsion to it. Simply because something like revolting to you doesn't make it wrong. Perhaps the only reason why it's revolting to you is because you were taught to be revolted by it. Or perhaps it just doesn't make sense to you because it's not part of your sexual MO. Modus operandi, perhaps it's not part of it. Now, of course, if it were part of your sexual MO, you probably wouldn't find it repulsive at all. See, your emotional responses are subjective here, is what this is getting at. 
So to try to say that we can have some kind of objective understanding of rightness and wrongness, according to this view, fails to see how we come to our value judgments. They say it's merely emotional preference. And even if you try to, to use this app and say, no, I am following it because it's God's law. Well, the, the expressivist would say it is because you have been trained to have an emotional sympathy for God's law. In other words, it is again an expression of preference rather than some kind of impartial, objectively arrived at truths. <clears throat> now, have I made sense, I hope, of these two species of moral nihilism? Error theory and expressivism. You should know the basics of these. But before uh, I finish up today, I did want to note for you that the author of the text thinks that it is implicit that despite these criticisms that he believes we should take seriously, there is a case to be made for what the author calls moral objectivity. And I suggest you look at some of the author's, uh, what shall I say, criticisms of moral subjectivism, as well as some of the reasons why the author contends it is implicit that when most of us make what we believe to be moral claims, that we believe that our moral judgments are more than just subjective things. And I'll give you my easy example. This is perhaps why we look for things that might try to ground objective morality. Kantianism, utilitarianism, social contract theory, natural law theory. These were all attempts to find absolute and or objective frameworks. Most of us don't believe that morality is just a matter of opinion, even though most of us do believe that certain value judgments are in fact a matter of taste. I would understand it if you didn't have the same musical taste as me. I wouldn't agree with you, but I would understand that that's something that we can agree to disagree about. I understand that we might disagree on our taste in fashion. And by the way, I exemplify my taste in fashion. You don't have to like it. I do this by choice. I don't happen to agree with a lot of people's aesthetic taste in fashion. But you notice, is that really a big deal? No, these are the kind of value judgments that we agree to, to disagree on. Why? Because typically nobody's getting killed in the process. In other words, these are the kind of things that we can politely uh, disagree about. But perhaps certain moral questions are things that we cannot, what is it, politely say, well, that's just a matter of opinion of that. Cheers until later. Oh, I have things to get back.